Thank you for uh, being with us uh, today to do the Skype interview for our IDM about Bring Me the Head of Tim Horton. Bring Me the Head of Tim Horton. I'll have a few uh, questions for you. Uh, the first one would be uh, how would you define Bring Me the Head of Tim Horton? Do you define it as a making of? As a documentary, yes, yes, as an essay film, straight ahead making of. Straight ahead making of is our that's our official line. Um, we that's what we were. Well, were we hired to make a making of? Sort of. We intended to make it as competently uh, and almost banally as possible, but we got you know we lost interest in pretty quickly in what we were doing quickly, and then started to do whatever we want because we are given sort of free reign to do whatever we want. So, but yes, we, I still think it is in essence a making of in a lot of ways or in most ways. We were, we, uh, Guy, we were working with Guy Madden at the time and, and, he, uh, we were, we were literally our pro, the project we were working on had stalled the forbidden room and we were waiting around for money and couldn't do anything. And, uh, a producer that one of our producers was also producing, uh, high in the road, and so guys, got, guy just suggested that we shoot the making of to just to make money as a cash grab, um, just you know for hire project, and they liked that idea. I think they liked uh, the high in the road production. People liked the idea that we would make something a little out of the ordinary. But at that point, I'm not sure we weren't totally certain how out of the ordinary we were gonna get. I don't think we yeah. just wanted to make the money <laughs> that we needed to survive. So It was sort of divided into the shooting phase and then the post-production phase. And during the shooting, I went to Jordan with uh, two camera people, John Gerdebeck and Jody Shapiro. And uh, we shot, Guy, Guy eventually came for maybe, he was on set for 48 hours or something, mm -hmm. mostly just wandering around in a, in a daze, uh, as you see in the film. Soon, I was in over my head, improvising wildly, careening, graveyard spiraling. I needed help. I knew most of Paul's crew members from back home, some of them really well, but they don't like me much. I soon suspected they were unswayably loyal to Hyena Road. Whatever. Whatever, whatever. We, we did still at that point while we were shooting on set didn't really know know what our plan was. We were just gathering a bunch of material, um, and in post production, that's when the th three of the were th three of us are directors because in post production we cobbled everything together uh, by working together and figuring out what we had to yeah, do. What do we do with all this stuff that we didn't plan? Yeah, because we had like a lot of documentaries, you just have a ton of material, um, and you have you have to shape it in the editing and that's because the three of us did that together that's why they're three directors I guess you'd say and we you know the cons when the concept started to emerge it was an organic uh, production of the three of us I guess you'd say but yeah the, the jobs were divided up Guy narrated it and didn't do a whole lot else other than conceptual discussion I edited it Galen did a lot of the sound and music so that was that's basically how we divided it up the sound work uh, is uh, really memorable in the film. The scene didn't feel like it was quite enough without some sort of mischief in the sound design. It looked great, but it felt like it needed a bit more mischief there before it um, before it started to say something. Maybe. Also, we wanted it. We were always pushing. It was our philosophy uh, to push the movie into the realm of the artificial as much as possible. And the sound design really takes. It doesn't feel real. It's odd. It's it. <laughs> You know, the sounds are like clo sound close-ups almost, like they're isolated and they're too loud and they're too present. And we were, I guess, intent on experimenting with ways of taking the footage and the scenes that Paul Gross's movie, Hyena Road, was using and veering them away from what 
what he was doing. He was doing, trying to do a sort of traditional realism. realism. Yeah. Although it's, you know, it's still in the tradition of Hollywood action movies, so it's not quite full realism either. Um, we were, we wanted to just veer in the completely opposite direction, almost as a philosophical principle, which is sort of, there's some voiceover in the film to that effect that sort of articulates our vision for why, uh, you know, film ought to be an artificial uh, creation, inability to I guess. So the sound contributed heat. to that. Finally, it was someone's idea of a funny joke to cast me as a slain Taliban soldier in the deepest, deepest background of some glorious Canadian raking of an Afghan village. Look at me. A director who has stood on stages at all the great film festivals in the world, instructed by the first AD to remain still at the margins of this big budget frame. Dead, inert, would you say that the voiceover in the film, the whole voiceover has to be taken for granted? What it is saying, I mean, both because the, the voiceover is, keeps moving from uh, pseudo-autobiographical comments to very frank uh, comments, surprisingly frank comments about the film being yeah. shot to uh, more like film aesthetic theory principles at some point. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about the uh, the concept behind the voiceover and all those like manifestation incarnations. Yeah, I mean, with uh, the human voiceover, like there's sort of two kinds of voiceover in the film: guy uh, who's the human being voiceover, and then we have a sort of robot drone narrating some of the film. And yeah, I think guy was articulating things that he felt. Uh, so it's it's meant to be taken seriously and honestly. Um, He's on good terms with Paul Gross, but we we were always adamant that he should be fairly free with his, you know, with his pettiest in, uh, feelings, with all the worst um, jealousies that he felt. We wanted him to articulate them. If he was mad at Paul, we wanted him to say it out loud because we felt we would approach a kind of honesty. Um, and it would just be interesting to have two films who have such an adversarial relationship with one another. We thought that that... We hadn't really happened before, from what we could see in making of documentaries, um, for you know, for a lot of good reasons. But uh, we had a chance to do it, so we really wanted to up that sort of adversarial relationship to see what that sort of that tension created. Yeah, I think that's true. Like, um, and then the, the 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 drone or robot narration is a serious articulation, over articulation, because it's like overwritten and kind of florid and. Um, ridiculous, but it's still that's that's sort of the fact that it's fairly ridiculous and overwritten is a trying to I think mask the the underlying message of it, which is a complete articulation of guys and our aesthetic philosophy, which I'm not going to summarize here because <laughs> yeah, I want you to pay attention in the movie. But it is it it's almost like at first it feels like it's supposed to sound like nonsense, but that that's a deception, that it's really exactly how we feel about movies and how they should be. So, that's... And if they... I know, there's two... And they're two vastly different kinds of narration, mm -hmm. and we're not sure they they come together perfectly or anything like that. But the whole movie's a big mash of stuff, so we're not too worried, I don't think. So, what, at, at some point, when did you decide... As you say, like, the, the movie puts a lot of concepts and lots of... Um, aesthetics together in such a short time time frame so at some point did you decide like maybe we're we're doing too much like it's we're going like in all directions uh nope. were you were you free to do whatever you wanted also yeah. because it's a it's a very unusual project to uh do such yeah. a document a making of we never we never thought there's that there's too much stuff here we have to mm -hmm. focus. That's just not how we... No. We we're, always, we're always thinking there's not enough. We, not need, enough more. Stuff, we need to get yeah. more of ourselves. We're not giving enough. Yeah. There's not enough variety. There's not yeah. enough ideas. So, so we, we tend to, yeah, skew in the other direction. Yeah. And now that is also really annoying for... You know, you don't want to give an audience too little. That's what we're always worrying about. But also, we, ended up, we end up always erring on the side of giving too much, too much stuff so that it's no longer coherent. But whatever. Uh, that's what we do. Um, we'll work on that. <laughs> um, but um, no one ever stopped us from doing, like, you know, Paul Gross and his producers never particularly stopped us. There were some moments late in the editing where things got tense, 
-hmm. which is what, with that almost by design, we all agreed that since there was going to be a kind of pretend antagonism between our making of film and the actual film, it, it would have been a huge disappointment if there hadn't been some tension. So we actual liars, if yeah. there did arise some real tension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. So there was tension about what we were doing a little bit, but they were. But I, it has to be said that while we were making it, Paul and his producers were ludicrously open-minded. Yeah, uh, and even and fighting it, for us and because there were other powers that wanted that saw this film and said, "No, this is going to be bad for Hanging Road." But they yeah. really, uh, Paul and Eve, really fought for it. So yeah, um, sort of like you know Goliath going around looking for stones and giving them to David. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. They helped, they did. They were on our. Goliath was on our side too. So. Yeah. Um, uh, I would. It would be fun to say that we were meddled with a lot, um, and that they tried to suppress our vision, but they didn't. Uh, it, during the during while we were making it, anyway. I mean, we'll see. Which is even more surprising because you you mentioned uh, the uh, the support of Paul Gross, uh, and also the fact that you you like to play with the uh, the tension between him and Guy in terms of visions and everything because it. It worked well. Uh, at the same time, he's he's barely there in the in the film. You see him a bit, but his presence is very very diffuse, right? That's it's, true. Yeah. It's not like you really see him at work, really. Not much. Uh, we do. We did interview him, but we didn't allow him to say anything. Like, there's a scene where he's sitting in a chair, mm -hmm. and we're ready to interview him. You know, like for a standard making of, but we don't let him say anything. We just lecture at him. That was kind of a. Yeah, so that's by the, the fact that Paul doesn't get a say almost in the film, or that we don't give him an opportunity to show himself at work, was part of the sort of antagonistic joke um, where we would. Uh, yeah, I think we, were, we it appealed to us to to sit him down for an interview and then not even let him speak, but to just yeah. like tell him things <laughs> was uh, pretty appealing <laughs> as a concept. And he, yeah, again, he didn't, as you can see, he sits there and takes it. He was a good sport about everything. The last sequence is very memorable, um, especially for people from Quebec, because you're using uh, yeah. on the sound uh, for the soundtrack. You're using an, an album from uh, Guy Lafleur yeah. uh, from the '70s. How did you end up with a such an idea and b finding that album? I mean, no one here knows it even existed. <laughs> We, um, I don't know where I first heard it. Just I think a friend showed it to me years ago, like has a copy and. Um, and it's kind of amazing and I like disco enough so I found it catchy and I found it funny that you would uh, try to teach someone hockey through the medium of disco <laughs> it, it doesn't feel like a, a conventional mashup of elements and so, it, the, so the, that album was always has always been sitting around in our heads I think and this felt like a perfect it's a It just the song Guy Lafleur is talking about. He's teaching you how to shoot, and it instant. I don't know. I think the second we knew we were making this movie, the fact that that this Guy Lafleur song exists, where he's teaching you how to shoot a hockey puck, but it sounds like he might be teaching you how to shoot with a camera or teaching you how to shoot with a gun. It was a. It just, it just brought everything. Together. It just had so to. It yeah. had to happen. And then once you realize that, there's all kinds of extra lyrics in the song that feel like they're resonating in special ways. Even if they're not, but and the song is joyously ludicrous, uh, and I, so I think it was the right tone for us. Once you have mastered a good shot, you must learn when to use it. It's important when you practice your shots to always shoot towards the target. Control of any shot comes from a close or open blade. To keep the shot low, close the blade, and to shoot it high, all you have to do is open the blade. We wanted to make a film that was just a little bit disrespectful towards Canada in general, or something. Uh, towards the thing, that, things that Canada is valuable to Canada. I don't to know. To offset all the patriotism that yeah, would have been in Hyena Road. Sure, I guess it was just like um, not. It's not like it's an attack on the troops at all or anything like that. But it's like a, since Hyena Road was caring about the country and what you know what it means to be Canadian, we wanted to. Uh, just take pot shots at the country, and it, that felt like a good song to do it with. It's just so light and so much energy, and it's ridiculous. And there it is. And so now, now that you've done uh, the project, is it something you'd consider doing um, in the next years, like become like a super team of Canadian making of? 
Yes, that's what we want to do. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We're, we just will need to be hired to do it. It's. It doesn't seem like, like it. In some ways, it's a bad uh, con card film for us because it. It's just an attack on the film. It, it that, scares you know, off it's, producers. It would, you'd think it would scare directors. off anyone yeah. who would, would want to hire us for it. But yes, we're eager to do it. In fact, we're trying to. We've been trying to figure out how to get hired to make a to do the making of on a Christopher Nolan film because we have some we feel like we have some interesting things to say <laughs> on that subject. So we're trying, but you know that yes, that's our goal. He hasn't called us yet. He has not, no. Okay. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Michael Kennedy. I'm in Aqaba, Jordan, on the set of Paul Gross's upcoming movie, Hyena Road. Now the movie's being shot in Jordan, but it's actually set in Afghanistan. It follows a Canadian platoon as they fight for their lives. Stay tuned. We're going to go behind the scenes. <laughs>